My name is Major Mario Malpica, and I am the Senior Air Defense Artillery OCT at the National Training Center in Fort Irwin, California. I have my team joining us today to discuss how to counter unmanned aircraft systems. I'm Sergeant First Class Kevin Denton. We provided some Army references regarding counter UAS, Army tactical systems, and additional reference to assist in planning and coordinating with higher than Brigade Echelon during LISCO. If you are a novice in planning against enemy UAS, we recommend you begin in ATP 3-01.15, ATP 3-01.16, ATP 3-01.81, and the Center of Army Lessons Learned, Handbook 22-07, highlighted in blue. The small quote comes out of ATP 3-01.15 describing specifically the problem enemy UAS groups 1 and 2 create for friendly units due to their ability to mass behind terrain and to avoid being detected. Integrated with weapon platforms, the UAS threat can be extremely devastating for our forces. Groups 1 and 2 are not the only UAS threats that we need to worry about. The enemy will adapt capabilities for all UAS groups to have negative effects on our forces. Likely, cost-effective means would drive the usage of groups 1 through 3 to have intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities or to be used as a direct strike platform. Groups 4 and 5 being more costly and having capabilities to stay outside the range of shore range air defense will likely still be utilized for ISR and be integrated with long range fires. Friendly tactical units may likely have shore range air defense effects on groups 1 through 3 and may have detection capabilities for all the groups. Generally, tactical units should focus on eliminating the enemy groups 1 through 3 UAS threats and coordinate joint force partners to eliminate the groups 4 and 5 in support of the land domain. For this reason, the following problem statement was developed. How do tactical units neutralize enemy groups 1 through 3 UASs and coordinate joint effects to, at a minimum, disrupt enemy groups 4 and 5 threats influencing their area of operations? The counter UAS process depicted on the bottom of the slide will assist tactical units in thinking of ways to meet its mission against the UAS problem. Units must have the means to detect and track UASs, train the human in the loop to identify the UAS as friend or foe, and if the U.S. is hostile, then how is the unit defeating the U.A.S. threat? Finally, if able to capture the U.A.S. or any existing components, does your unit have the ties to exploit the enemy system capabilities to render it useless in the future? My name is Captain Matthew Phillips. I am Major Malpica's assistant and the ADA trainer for NTC. The first thing we must do to counter U.A.S. is to know the operational environment specifically for the UAS threat. The Army has a process already in doctrine, which is the intelligence preparation of the battlefield, conducted during the mission analysis portion of the military decision-making process. The Air Missile Defense Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield, or AMD IPB, is also a doctrinal process that mirrors IPB, but pivots on the air domain. AMD IPB should be conducted by the Air Defense Planner to assist the S2 and S3 during the IPB process. The first step is to define the operational environment. We do this first by looking at the terrain, identifying likely air avenues of approach, and then finally putting this all over the modified divine obstacle overlay, or MACU. Step two is to define environmental effects. Things such as weather will affect operations by aerial platforms, both friendly and enemy. For example, if winds are high, it is likely that there would not be any groups one or two UAS operations. Additionally, if cloud coverage is low, groups four and five may be operating below the cloud ceiling levels in order to have observations. Step three is to evaluate the threat. AMD IPB will focus on likely aerial observation areas, likely areas of munitions release, likely fields of fire for air defense systems, and extremely critically is analyzing the employment of systems along with the most likely air on this approach. We recommend you break down the threats as seen on the slide. Furthermore, you can break down the UAS into groups 1 through 3 and groups 4 through 5. Groups 1 through 3 falls within the low-flying threats, but 4 through 5 will need to be defeated by resourcing assets at the division or higher echelon levels. Step 4. Determine the threat coalesce. Put on your red hat and decide where to employ the enemy's arsenal for air threats. Additionally, the low-level flying threats will likely support the units, so understanding the grand scheme maneuver will assist in developing likely deployment of enemy small UAS. Finally, the creation of running estimates should be developed during the mission analysis portion and should transition from the plan to execution. 
As AMD IPB is a continuous effort, we will cover some processes that can be used to keep current and relevant. Foremost, maintaining an accurate and updated running estimate is key to helping you understand your threats and assets available to counter the enemy air threat. The running estimate is a useful tool to help you battle track and is essential for helping your commander visualize the common operating picture. Two other processes that can help with planning, tracking, and mitigating UAS threats that tactical units can employ in their battle rhythm is the Protection Working Group and the Target Working Group. The Protection Working Group, or PWG, is a forum where units can create and continue to refine the prioritized protection list. The PPL is a tool that is ultimately blessed off by the commander that lists all critical units, capabilities, assets, and areas that the unit has and needs protected for mission success. The PPL is a tool to help the commander visualize what the enemy would be attempting to target and what the unit can do to protect it. As part of the PPL, we'll need to create the critical asset list. We'll start by pulling up your unit's task organization, break down assets that are at each echelon so you have everything that is critical for mission accomplishment. You can adopt the criticality, vulnerability, threat, or CVT process that is conducted by the Army Air Missile Defense Commands to assist the Joint Forces Commander with developing the Dieter Cal. The CVT metric can be found in the ATP 3-01.94. Questions for each category will have to be tailored to your echelon. There should be 10 points total for each category with a couple of 0.5 additions options for your discretion. Once you value for each critical asset, you can enumerate them. You can present this work to your commander as a science behind the process. The commander will then give any further guidance and refinements. Finally, we'll do the defended asset list which is a finalization and allocation of ADA units to critical assets until there's nothing remaining to defend them with. All of this will combine in forming the PPL. The PPL adopts the CAL as a place to start. The threats to be evaluated should include those covered during AMD IPB. This includes UAS threats, as you can use this form to see what enemy UAS are likely to target and allocate available resources to protect those targets from enemy destruction and observation. The PPO is more in-depth and goes through the process of adopting mitigation measures when there's nothing left to defend a critical asset against each threat. Next is the targeting working group. Another process that can be implemented to help defeat enemy UASs. Units normally focus on the ground enemy systems, but conducting an aerial targeting working group would assist the ADA and EW forces. This can either be implemented into the overall targeting working group, or a separate one can be created to focus solely on the aerial platforms. This process can help either facilitate attack operations to the left of aerial platform launches, or the allocations of sensors and shooters to the right of aerial platform launches. The intent is to prioritize the aerial threats for the air tasking order cycle. Then identify primary and ultimate detection capabilities and effects to neutralize aerial threats. The UAS threat is evolving. We're going to look at some current enemy TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures being utilized currently around different theaters. There are trends of enemy Group 3 one-way fixed-wing UASs, also referred to as loitering munitions, employed to strike hard targets many times in a synchronized attack with either missiles, cruise missiles, or rockets. Group 1 UASs are being utilized mainly in the front lines. Many of these are commercial off-the-shelf, procured. Group 1 UASs are often seen being used in conjunction with artillery strikes and are a good indicator of potential incoming on your friendly position. To make matters worse, Group 1 UASs are hard to detect and increasingly are commercial off the shelf, meaning UASs are no longer a tool for just state actors, but also non-state actors and anyone can buy and fly them with minimum effort. The likelihood of UAS Group 4 and 5 performing ISR on friendly locations increases as we see more large-scale combat in different theaters. Finally, we see on open source another trend that nations or non-nation states have been responsible for drone threats and attacks utilizing UAS technology from Iran or China. I'd like to discuss the aerial UAS threats we have here at the National Training Center. We begin with the Group 1. We have DJI Phantoms, which are commercial off the shelves. Also, the OP4 utilizes Ravens, which replicates ASN-15s. The TSM-800s are the drone swarm capable drones up to 100, and they can employ grenade-sized submunitions on units. For Group 2s, the OP4 has Pumas, which replicate the Skylark. For Group 3s, the OP4 has the Outlaws, which replicate the Orland 10, and the Shadow as well, which replicates the Four Post. And finally, we have a Group 4 capability with the Gray Eagle, which replicates the Orion. The National Training Center is replicating these threats seen in theaters to give the training audience a more realistic training environment, forcing them to think about the enemy UAS capabilities and to better prepare them for future conflict.
Rule 6 says, when possible, layered active air defense with passive air defense measures as additional mitigations. Follow ADA principles and deployment tenants. ADA crews need guidance on fire induction, fine throughout the fight, accounting for munition expenditure and firing sequence when they're in the layered defense. Procedural controls and airspace management maximizes operations and identification procedures. Identification authorities should be thought out for each threat. Ideally, the crews if trained properly on visual aircraft recognition or VACR may be delegated ID authority. Ideally, the theater special instructions or SPINs and the area air defense plan account for this battle drill. It is always a good idea for tactical units to have the discussion with their division on whether the theater AADP or the SPINs covers this. Future modernization will be key to developing technologies capable of detecting and defeating this rapidly emerging and evolving threat. We provided some recommendations for the force and industry partners to consider. Priorities of effort that will pay off quickly is the manufacturing of more lethal rounds such as airburst proximity rounds or HEDP SD rounds. These rounds have higher probability of kill and use less ammunition to achieve a kill than the standard bowl ammunition. Other areas of high payoff quickly are updating Drone Buster, Drone Defender to have effects on military grade SUAS and Skyview to detect military grade UASs. More medium to long term efforts will be to continue to develop of new SHORAD capabilities and rebuilding of our SHORAD force that can maneuver with the ground forces. The soldiers need to be in a platform that will give them a tactical advantage and allows them to focus more on shooting rather than maintenance and complex operation platforms. The shorehead platform need to have low threshold onboard fire control radar that can be tied into the guns and missiles. The missiles need to give more range, not necessarily high altitude, but to have more standoff against low flying threat, allowing the employment of the early engagement tenant. Implementing low threshold sensors to be mounted on Group 4 UAS to give tactical units the capability to detect Group 1 through 3 UAS threats. This will enhance the range of the sensors and will not deal so much with line of sight challenges accounted for on ground based sensors. This will be a continuous process that involves discussion with the various centers of excellences, industries, the Joint Counter Small UAS Office. Finally, For tactical unit countering this emerging threat, we recommend focusing on basics such as conducting AMD IPB as part of unit staff training, cross-training stinger teams with SHORAD units, and training with individual kinetic and non-kinetic systems such as drone buster smart shooters. Additionally, SHORAD battalion and battery echelons should work on providing air battle management for ADA forces supporting maneuver units. Have a great Army day. Train, fight, win.